Hello and welcome to the Limbo Fantasy. My name is Ola and today I would like to talk to you about Tris Marigold, a sorceress and a definite redhead. I will be briefly mentioning, but not getting into, some events from the Witcher book saga, show and games, so this is your very minor spoiler warning. Tris Marigold is not a one-dimensional character. She is a blushing youngster, so easily manipulated by others, and a confident, grown woman who well knows what she wants and what she stands for. She is venerable, fearless, and a complete coward. She loves those close to her and will go to any lengths to help them, yet she also cheats and screws them over. She is a talented magician allergic to magical elixirs. Tris is complicated and singular. As she says herself to Ciri, it is better to count yourself among the exceptions than be one of the many. Tris was born and raised, at least until her magical gift was discovered, in Maribor, which is one of the main cities of Temeria. Her tiny tower, which she calls home and longs to go back to in times of fear, is there. Tris Marigold is the youngest sorceress we get to know. According to her own thoughts on the matter, she was born about 50 years after the attack on Ker Moren, an event mentioned both in the books and in the games where Ker Moren was attacked and all the witchers residing there killed. We will not be getting into that here, however. That makes Tris barely 25 years old during the Battle of Sodden Hill and not even 30 during the events described in the books. And consequently, she is from 32 to 37 years old during all the Witcher games. To put this in some perspective, Yennefer is 65 years older than Tris. Tris is considered quite beautiful, and many men are attracted to her. She was even on the cover of Polish Playboy magazine in 2011, the first virtual star of that particular magazine with all the photos accompanying the interview inside made by Geralt of Rivia, of course. Her defining feature is her long, lustrous chestnut hair, and this hair seems to be quite a point of contention, with some claiming that Tris is and should be a redhead, and others vehemently denying that. Problem originates, I think, in the description of her hair color as chestnut. Kasztanowe in original Polish, as it is in itself not very precise and can mean as many things as there are shades of chestnuts, which are many. However, Sapkowski provides us with several details concerning Tris's hair, which will allow us to solve this conundrum once and for all. In Blood of the Elves, Tris's hair color is described as fresh chestnut with a sheen of gold. And in the short story Something Ends, Something Begins, it is described as October Chestnut. Both those details paint a picture of a young chestnut that did not yet have a chance to darken. Something Ends, Something Begins story is not considered a part of canon, but the hair argument stands nonetheless. And here it is, a young Polish chestnut barely out of its shell. Further detail is provided by Krach and Kreite in the Tower of the Swallow, where he says that Tris's hair is like fire in the candlelight, clearly suggesting that her particular shade of chestnut is of reddish variety. But the final and irrefutable proof of Tris's redheadedness comes from Yennefer herself. In The Lady of the Lake, our two sorceresses quarrel on their way to Rivia, and Yennefer states that she would like to grab Tris by that ginger mop of hair. And nobody, especially not Yennefer, would waste such a perfect, if mild, insult on a hair that is not actually red. So, there it is, straight from the author himself. Tris is a redhead. Definitely not Harry Potter's Weasley kind of redhead, but a redhead nonetheless. And neither the games nor the TV show gets Tris's hair actually right. Tris always wore her beautiful hair long and loose. It was a point of pride, a sign of an unconventional and free woman that belonged solely to herself. 
In the world of the Witcher, only druids, magicians and ladies of the evening wear their hair loose. And here also games presented differently. In the first game her hair is simply much too short. From the second game on, Tris wears her hair tightly bound. Of course, she could have just simply changed her preferred hairstyle over the years. We could also argue that this change in hairstyle could signify a loss of freedom, first to the machinations of the Lodge and later to the Nilfgaardian witch hunt. But that might be stretching it a little. The show gives Tris her long loose hair but makes it very curly, which is not exactly inconsistent with the books as Tris's hair is never described as straight or curly, so really I guess it could be either way. Another defining feature of Tris, which again all the games and the TV show get wrong, are her big cornflower blue eyes. Tris in the games has green eyes and in the show brown. Seems like a strange detail to change needlessly. Well, I just spent entirely too much time talking about Tris's looks, but she also spends entirely too much time on that, so I feel somewhat justified. She can bathe even several times a day, uses very expensive cosmetics and even requests her hair to be brushed every day when she is too ill and weak to do it herself. She also boasts a 22 inch waistline and she goes to great lengths to keep it that way, trying to always keep to her healthy diet. Tris, just like possibly every enchantress ever, is a very political animal. She was a personal advisor to King Foltest of Temeria and was a part of Temerian Royal Council, along with two other mages, Keira Metz and Ferkart. Years later, after the witch hunts shown in Witcher 3, she becomes a personal advisor of King Tancred of Kovir. She joined the Lodge of Sorceresses when it was first created and took active part in the events at Tanet. She neither understands nor approves of Geralt's neutrality, which she describes as superciliousness distance and indifference. Tris does not want to be indifferent. She wants to help. She wants to fight the root of world's problems. She wants to save her friends and most of all, she wants her actions and sacrifices to matter. As she says herself, she does not want to see the world fall into pieces. Not participating in the Battle of Brenna causes her quite a bit of distress, as it robs her of the possibility of standing for something she believes in, she knows is correct, and doing it completely of her own volition, not because she was told to. Tris Marigold can be practically a blue-eyed idealist. Tris is remembered as venerable and known far and wide as the 14th killed at Sodden. Her name is carved on the obelisk, commemorating all the mages that died in defense of Sodden Hill. Tris was mistakenly counted as dead after the battle because, as she says herself, there was really nobody left alive who knew her well enough to identify her. Except for Yennefer, but she was blinded during the battle. The battle left Tris with her hair burned away and some of her scars never healed, but she was most certainly alive. On a side note, because of the scars, book Tris never wears plunging necklines, and all her outfits are buttoned up all the way to the neck. However, both games and the show choose to ignore that fact in favor of showing us some cleavage. So, after all that praise, it might surprise you to know that the venerable Tris Marigold, the 14th guild at Sodden, the talented enchantress and the advisor to kings, is, or maybe rather was, for a very long time, a complete coward. Yennefer remembers that Tris during the Battle of Sodden Hill was dying in fear, paralyzed, just standing there with trembling lips. Tris herself admits that she threw up and fainted from fear, that at some point she even forgot all of her spells except for one that would teleport her home to Maribor. She doesn't use it though, and she is hit by a powerful enemy spell. Her battle on the hill 
ends in pain and fire, with her body devastated and her hair, her pride and defining feature gone. Tris is deathly afraid of both pain and death, and that fear does not go away after the Battle of Sodden Hill. It intensifies. Yennefer claims that Tris will be dying of fear her whole life, for whoever doesn't overcome the cowardice inside themselves will die of fear to the end of their days. And Cynthia, an Ilfgaardian mage in Witcher 2, claims that Tris lacks determination and courage. As a side note, the Battle of Southern Hill is presented quite differently in the show, and we get a rather more courageous Tris. Luckily for Tris herself, both Yennefer and Cynthia were somewhat wrong. When it mattered the most, during the Rivian pogrom, Tris overcame her fear. At first, she wanted to flee. She was terrified and practically paralyzed. But when Yennefer gets hit in the head, Tris transforms from a scared little puppy to a fierce lioness. She will not run anymore. I shan't run away, she says to Yen. I shan't hide behind the lodge's skirts. And don't worry, I shan't faint from fear like I did at Sodden. I shall vanquish it inside me. I have already vanquished it. Tris claimed for years that she is not a little girl from Maribor Tower anymore. But that was a lie. Yes, she could be forceful with her opinions, like any sorceress. She could be political and tried to appear in control. But all that was just smoke and mirrors. She was just a scared little girl, pushed around, used and basically ignored by the other mages. And that, at least some of that, changes here, in Rivia. Here, she finally stands up and takes action, not because someone else tells her to, but because she decides so. And she does so without fear. This is a moment that ensures that Tris is remembered as fearless Tris Marigold. And this is also the moment when Tris casts her first and possibly only original spell. Not that she really means to do that, Along with Yennefer, she tries to cast Alzur's Thunder, to scare and disperse the rioting crowd. However, the spell comes out wrong, and instead of lightning striking few choice targets, a hellish hailstorm appears. And everyone is bombarded by hailstones the size of chicken eggs. As you can imagine, being hit by a fast-traveling hefty ice ball is not very good for your health and many people are killed or maimed, effectively ending the pogrom. Nobody, including Tris herself, was ever able to reproduce that spell. So it was never officially recorded, but it became known as Marigold's Hailstorm. This changed and more courageous Tris is the Tris that we see in the second and third Witcher game. Yes, she is still a bit of a pawn of a lodge and gets herself kidnapped, but she endures torture without breaking twice, even biting her torturer in Witcher 3. And in the third game, she does anything she can to help the outlawed mages and alchemists in Novigrad, risking her own well-being in the process without much of a second thought. She does not shy away from fighting the wild hunt. These trees is more mature and stronger. Tris is usually cheerful and has a propensity to giggle for seemingly no reason. She also blushes, often and most prettily, especially in the presence of Geralt. In the books, we only get a few brief mentions of Tris's romance with Geralt. It is unclear how long ago it happened and how long it lasted. So we can imagine here anything from a one-night stand to a somewhat longer fling. What we do know is that Tris was both curious and jealous of an exceedingly emotional and turbulent relationship that Yennefer had with Geralt. Tris herself, after some quite standard vagrancies of youth, which included but were not limited to sleeping around just because it was forbidden and experimenting with the same sex relations, settled quite comfortably into what most enchantresses end up eventually doing, 
having sporadic and wholly unsatisfying sexual encounters with other wizards. She found those frustrating and coldly technical. They might have satisfied purely physical needs, but did nothing to quench emotional ones. What Yen had with Geralt seemed completely different, and Tris wanted to experience that raw emotion, that excitement, anxiety, pain, hurt and love all rolled into one. So, taking advantage of yet another serious fight and breakup of Geralt and Yen, she seduced the Witcher with help of a bit of magic. As she says, she did not want to steal Yennefer's man, she just wanted the experience. And she got exactly what she wanted. Geralt's pain, anxiety, guilt. But she also got what she didn't expect, and she fell in love, or at least developed a serious crush on the Witcher. She thinks about him a lot, blushes at the mere mention of his name, and hold some hope of resuming the relationship, or at least maybe having him for one more night. In a moment of weakness, she even admits to Geralt that she is envious of Yennefer, jealous of her having him. Geralt likes Tris, cares about her, and clearly finds her attractive, but he pushes her away. He loves Yennefer that much. There are, however, two moments in the books that are quite vague, but also suggestive, and left open to reader's interpretation. If you would like, you can easily imagine that Tris gets Geralt for this one more night. The show did not tackle this storyline yet, but the games continue the Tris geralt story. Geralt can romance and develop his relationship with Tris throughout all three Witcher games. Finally, if he so desires, building a new life with her in Kovir. In Witcher 3, Geralt can also specifically choose Tris over Yennefer. If we would like to be uncharitable, we could make the case that Tris in the games is taking advantage of the situation, and Geralt's soap opera amnesia to woo him and finally get the relationship she wanted. That she must have known that Yennefer is not dead, and is somewhere out there from the very beginning, and she chose not to tell the Witcher anything about that part of his past for such a long time on purpose. In the first game, she even acts more like Yennefer than Tris, which would support the theory that all she is doing is calculated, trying to appeal to the side of Geralt that loved Yen so wholeheartedly and make him fall in love with her instead or it could just be a bit of bad character design in the first game. However, we can also look at Game Trees here as just a young, vulnerable woman that fell in love and is simply taking advantage of an opportunity to be with the object of her affections. No malice or calculated plans involved. Whichever trees works better for you. As a love side note, I should really mention something and something begins story. It is not an official part of the canon, so bear that in mind. In that story, Tris ends up with another Witcher from Geralt's school, Eskel, and she seems quite taken with him. Indeed, in the Blood of the Elves book, she even mentions that Eskel emanates stronger than Geralt, so she is probably drawn to these strong emotions. Whichever way you swing it, it seems that Tris may be just a bit of a drama junkie. Tris's love life may be a bit lacking, but she has many people in her life she cares about deeply. Yennefer and Tris are close friends, even though they rarely see eye to eye, and, apart from being enchantresses, have really little in common. They fight a lot, not always over Geralt, with Yennefer usually dominating Tris. But they also help each other and look out for one another when it really counts. Tris also taught Ciri in Kerr Moren for many months and developed a very close relationship with her, started to consider her a young sister. So it is not surprising that when at the end of the saga Ciri sails away with Geralt and Yennefer, Tris wants to go with them. At this moment, she is losing all the people she cares about in one stroke. Luckily for Tris, Ciri swiftly dismisses that idea. Still, 
a bit sad, we must admit. And not to end on a sad note, let's end instead with this most noteworthy quote from Trees. You've seen one, you've seen them all. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe and consider sharing it with others. I hope to always be improving, so suggestions, comments and constructive criticism are welcome. Leave them in the comments below. Have a nice day and I'll see you next time.